Anthony. I've been working on the Windows and ARM port of Blender for the past couple of years now. Um, and I'm basically just going to talk about my experience porting Blender. So, first of all, a bit about me. Um, I have a different background to a lot of people here at BlenderCon. I'm not an artist, never have been, can't draw, but I came from an electronics background. Um, I did my master's in electronics, and then I moved on to, um, from performance analysis, and then I moved on to platform bring up. So essentially they gave us a dev board like this. So that's the Neoverse reference platform. So that's now powering a lot of the cloud. Um, so that was the initial reference platform that we had. They basically gave us a board and went, go and boot Linux on it. And that's all we got. Um, so uh, then after that, um, I moved on to the, uh, it was working on GPU drivers at, um, at ARM as well. Um, we basically worked on the team that connected up the GPU drivers to uh, Linux, which is kind of where I got my introduction into graphics. Um, and then I moved on to Linaro, where I we work on the Windows and ARM enablement team. Um, so who are Linaro? They, we were founded in 2010, um, and we basically maintain um, open source software and contribute support for various things, various drivers, boards, computers, things like that, and sort of maintain open source software. Um, we're very frequently in the top, if not the top contributor to the Linux kernel on most release cycles, um, just for the sheer amount of ARM development boards that there are out there. Um, <laughs> so um, I work in the Windows and ARM group. It was started in 2021. Um, when Microsoft began pushing Windows and ARM more sort of in earnest, and they teamed up with Qualcomm and ARM um, to sort of fund our group. And what we do is we basically take open source software and we port it to Windows on ARM. So basically making sure things run natively. But what is Windows and ARM? So Windows and ARM, aka WOA, I'm going to use that acronym a lot because otherwise my slides would basically just be half of that. Um, it's first of all, first available in 2018. Um, don't go hunting out a computer from 2018 for this. They're really not very good at all. Um, but it has moved on in leaps and bounds. And it is the same Windows that you know. And it does, it's not locked down to use the store. It's a normal copy of Windows. It's not WinRT, which is what a lot of people remember Windows and ARM as being. It's not WinRT. Um, <laughs> it's exactly the same and it will emulate x86 and x664. So all your normal applications that you have will just run on it. There will be a performance hit, but it will just run. Um, it's considerably more energy efficient than alternative platforms available. <laughs> um, it's got this ThinkPad here that I've got has a 22 and a half hour normal usage. So if you started it with a charge at the start of a work week. You could charge it once throughout the course of the week and you would just be able to use your laptop. So you don't have to keep it charging with you all the time. I didn't even bother bringing one with me today. So that's how confident I am in it. <laughs> um, in fact, this screenshot here, that's from earlier today when I was eating lunch um, and I've been on my laptop all day. So they're quite, they're quite good for sort of productivity usage. Um, they're marketed as the Copilot Plus PCs. Um, which you may have seen advertising for around. I believe Qualcomm are on a bit of a push for that at the moment. And well, I'll let Linus Tech Tips uh, quote, do the talking for me. So they are actually quite good. But how did I end up working on Blender? So I was the only person on our team that actually used it. Someone basically came in and went, there's this big piece of software we need to use and it. We need to make it run natively on Windows and ARM. How do we do that? Well, I'd used it. That's a terrible model, by the way. It's about 200 megabytes and takes about five minutes to load. Um, it's not very good, but I'd, I'd used it. So it was then given over to me. And because I'd done some GPU driver stuff, it was that. And I do a lot of 3D printing as well. So if I wants to talk about 3D printing, I'll talk about it for hours, but I won't do that now. Um, so I'll just give a quick rundown of what I'll talk about, how I got started, the, the dependencies, how the build system works for the dependencies in Blender, some of the challenges and pitfalls that I had. Um, 
uh, then I'll talk about OpenGL and how OpenGL works on these devices, which is slightly more different to how you would expect. It's not just a native driver. Uh, some of the changes I made to Blender itself, and then a few other things, and I'll take some questions. So, getting started. So we needed to get a build of Blender. So I did a few investigations. The first thing that I tried was something called ARM64EC. ARM64EC is stands for ARM64 Emulation Compatible. It's an API that basically means you can build a native ARM64 application, but if you had a DLL or a library that came as a sort of a black box thing of basically you have to include this and a vendor has supplied it and you can only use it like this, you can mix and match in the same binary at the same time. Uh, and a good example here is the Office Suite is all like that because lots of IT departments like to ship custom phishing plugins and things like that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so you have a button in your thing for like report phishing. That was one of the most common things. So they make sure that extensions that go into Office that were shipped as DLLs can run natively on these machines. And it, it, it works. But you do lose half your available registers because this is a, you're emulating a CISC processor rather than a RISC processor. Um, and it was very new when I started. There was lots of compiler errors. It got about 10 files in and then broke. And OSL really, really didn't like it because it used a version of LLVM that wasn't aware of ARM64AC and it just broke in really weird ways. So we decided to go for a native build. And we started with something called VCPKG. VCPKG is um, it's a package manager. Think Conan or Python wheels or something like that. Um, essentially, you just go, I'd like a copy of this and your machine locally builds it. Um, so we got that working. It wasn't a, it was only good for a proof of concept really because Blender has some of its own custom patches on top of dependencies. Um, I disabled a few things like CPU ID, which I will cover later. Um, break the depressingly common assumption that Windows is x64, um, where people just include XMM in Trin and then just go wild. Um, and we did eventually get it to build. It took me a couple of weeks, but I got it to build after I broken through everything and it rendered the cube, which is great. So 3.4, that was the first version that I got building. But light isn't really good for anything other than showing that, yes, I can render a cube, very nice, thank you, but you can't use anything in Blender. So we needed to enable all of them. And the dependencies needed to be consistent with the other um, platforms. Blender has some specific patches where they enable or disable or add things in some of the dependencies some more so than others. So we needed to get them building natively. So building the dependencies, that was a big chunk of my work. Building Blender itself wasn't particularly complex. Um, there were just a few patches inside Blender, but the, uh, but the, the dependencies were that. So has anyone built the dependencies on Windows before? Okay, yeah, so a, a few of you. Um, do you know what the documentation says? Yes, <laughs> that's the entirety of the documentation for uh, building all of the dependencies. It basically says, go and read the code. Uh, and that actually goes to a single line that says, just call this script, which doesn't work. Um, so, so it was a bit of a trial by fire, I'll put it that way. Um, so how long do people think it takes to do a full rebuild of dependencies? I'll talk about Windows and ARM because that's what I have to hand. How long do you think it takes to do a full release and debug build? Ten and a half. Um, <laughs> there are 52 dependencies, and uh, three of them are full copies of LLVM. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of things. There's not much documentation on this, but 99.9% .9 of users won't need to do it. The fact that there was such a small group and such a focused talk already shows that how few people actually need to do this. So it's not particularly documented and it's not encouraged because if, if everyone went and built their own dependencies, the amount of issues that would arise in the bug tracker would just be exponential. You wouldn't be able to keep up with it. So, but it started, it was using GCC for various things, DP, DPCPP for other things and MSVC for everything else. So it was a big old mix of different compilers doing different things. Uh, we didn't have GCC and we don't really today. It only compiles C at the moment on Windows and ARM. Uh, DPCPP doesn't work on ARM, so DPCPP is the Intel SQL compiler, for those that don't know. Uh, and very few dependencies also had the really annoying assumption that Windows is x64. Um, so I'll give a very rough guide on how 
building it works. I won't go too much into it, but basically there's a batch script that calls CMake, which in turn calls projects underneath it, which it might sometimes or sometimes not build with a different compiler, depending on it and depending on which plat platform and architecture you're using. Some of them have patches applied on top of them as well. And projects need to sometimes depend on other projects. So there's a bunch of other projects that depend on different versions of LLVM at different times. Um, and then MSVC compiles a further three compilers. Um, so Sickle, a full copy of just vanilla LLVM, and ISPC. Uh, MSVC, by the way, is the Microsoft compiler that comes with Visual Studio 2022. Um, and that is native on ARM64, actually. It's, uh, Visual Studio is fully native, so the, the work is really going in to make this work. Um, but the, the big thing about all of this is that none of this is actually done in CI. There is no CI for any of this at all. Every platform maintainer individually builds all of this locally on their machine and then just uploads them afterwards. So there's no sort of one set of known working scripts that just makes everything work. You just kind of have to look at the code and hope that you can do it if you really need to. Um, but you know, that's how it works now. It didn't used to work like that. There was GCC and I had to remove GCC as part of the work. Um, so FFmpeg and its dependencies use GCC 4.9.4. So that was from 2017. So it's quite an old version of GCC, but it was considered if it works, don't break it. Um, and GCC 4.9 is an arm didn't exist. So we decided, I, after chatting to Ray, who maintains the x64 Windows builds, he basically just went, yes, okay, we'll unify on MSVC. That's probably easier for everyone, but good luck, I'm not helping. Um, <laughs> he said, I'll accept a pull request, but you're on your own. So, okay, great. Um, we still needed some Linux S tooling. Some of the individual dependencies just ship with a make file, and that's all you get. There is just a make file. Um, they have Windows in the make file, but it's still a make file. So we needed some Linux X tooling, so we had msys2, which we use for it. And msys2 is a thing I could do a whole other presentation on, but basically we have a very specific version that works and that's it. Um, most of the dependencies are possible to port, but we did remove xvid core. Um, so the xvid format from part of the, vid, uh, the video editor, we, we deleted it. It was from 2004 and hadn't been updated since and it just about worked. Uh, but ffmpeg had its own version of it, so it's okay. Um, so there were some other pitfalls and challenges. Now that it was working, um, there were some other pitfalls and challenges. I'll talk about a few of them. There were a lot more, but this presentation is 50 minutes, not 150 minutes. So I'll just talk about SIMD, that's the thing. Um, so SIMD, who here knows about SIMD? But SIMD, okay, so a number of you. Okay, so this is gonna be a sort of very sort of brief coverage of SIMD. So SIMD basically is single instruction multiple data. You put some data into a vector and you perform an operation of some sort on it. It does the same operation of any values at the same time. So for you, if you were to do this in straight C, if you were to add these two arrays together in C, you would use a for loop. You would do for whatever and then you'd index into number one, number two and store it in result and so on and so forth. This way, you just do it with a single call and you basically just let the compiler slash processor do it for you. Um, everyone's got their own version of SIMD. Um, Intel has SSE, we have ARM, Neon, and more modernly SVE, which is coming soon with ARM v9 at some point. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, this is ARM SIMD. So basically a breakdown, it's very easy. It's a vector, so of 128 bits, you're adding them together and you're telling it that it's UN32. That's all it does, and then everything else is just done for you basically. But implementations can differ by compiler. This compiles in Clang. This does not compile in MSVC. So apart from Arrow, because I've told you about this before, spot the issue with this code. What's the issue? Other than that it doesn't do anything with the return value. No? Okay. Uh, so it's actually a trick question. It compiles in Clang just fine, but MSVC implements them in a completely different way that's still in line with the spec. So it actually has a union that it defines as its backing type that you then um, do like that. But this, it strictly adheres to the C++ standard that basically says you can't initialize a union with any other type. So these inline initializers 
don't actually work. It should actually be written like this, which is the proper ARM documentation way of doing it, um, where you have to have a backing array, and then you have to load the backing array in, and only then do you do it. So most NEON code as actually written is wrong. And MSVC is technically right, but not the right kind of right, because you have to rewrite a bunch of your code to work differently. And that works across all compilers. So that's ARM SIMD. Now you're all experts in ARM SIMD. There's, this is Intel SIMD. Um, so it's Intel. So Intel is used in um, mostly here. A lot of code was already written, and it was written using SSE intrinsic, so that so that it was there. And it was decided what's an easy way to get a big performance win on ARM devices. Well, you convert it to Neon code. So this code here, this is actually built and compiled on an ARM device. You just write everything as if it was Intel, which, so this is the exact same thing, apart from you load it in backwards. Um, and then you print it out exactly the same and you get the exact same result of 2468 that you got before. It's all done at compile time, but it needed to be ported to work with MSVC. So doing it at compile time is a complex task and it relied a lot on sort of as, as it was described in the uh, issue on SSC to Neon, black magic, where basically they just mess around with the compiler until it does kind of what you want. What you want. Uses a bunch of extensions, and it, it's not the cleanest in code. It uses about six layers of macros all on top of each other, um, and it's not portable at all. And it's not always a one-to-one -one mapping, so you have to enable things like a precise square root, um, where the, in, the Neon implementation doesn't line up with the Intel implementation unless you do some extra operations written in C afterwards to kind of make it line up with it. But you don't always have to care about precision unless you're doing watertight meshes, in which case you do, and then you, there's a bunch of extra stuff you have to do. So it's not an always one-to-one -one mapping, and it's not always, you know, you don't get 100% of the performance, but you get enough performance that it's worthwhile doing. So you, for development time, you cut down your development time. Um, so that's SSC and SIMD, uh, which was essentially the biggest challenge because I had to unbreak a lot of assumptions in a lot of places. Um, there were some others. There was TBB. I won't go into TBB, but TBB manually exports all of its mangled symbols. Uh, it doesn't just let the linker do it for you. So mangled symbols for people that don't know, essentially when a DLL says, you can call this function, well, this is what the compiler sees, so it knows what arguments you can specify and so on and so forth. Um, and I had to deal with those because you think you get it right and then something else completely unrelated would break because it broke how the memory layout worked somewhere or something like that. The linker was very unhappy, but it's all temporary. But that's the problem. We're stuck because of the VFX reference platform. We're stuck on an old version of TBB. Modern TBB already has it. So I spent a load of time doing a bunch of work that's going to get binned off when the VFX reference platform next update. But at least it works now, eh? Um, and then Embry so it was the next one. So um, there was a lot of issues with Embry. Um, it uses its own copy of SSE to Neon with its own modifications that haven't been backported for some reason. Um, and I couldn't get support for MSVC merged. That's the uh, second comment on the issue. The first comment was me opening it, and this is three months later. Um, so I got no response. So I went, fine, I'll just use Clang instead. Luckily, we already built three copies of Clang as part of the <laughs> dependency build system. So it was fine. I just used one of the existing ones we had. But because some of the others were built with MSVC, you have to be able to mix and match your compilers. Um, so I had to write a good chunk of CMake that basically matches the version of the tools that MSVC uses with Clang. And it only works with certain kinds of generator in CMake and so on and so forth. But essentially, once you've generated all your stuff, you just put it in this little XML file here, and it should, in, in, in theory, work. In theory. Um, not always. Uh, so we had to do that. So those were the big things. There were a bunch of others. I won't talk about them. Some of them were basically just a case of switch a bunch of, you know, switch a bunch of compiler flags around. Others were, you know, retrofit CMake which I did to a number of projects. Uh, and some of those are upstreamed. Others of them uh, are basically just never going to 
go in because they're essentially abandoned where at this point some of the things that are in the dependency tree <coughs> Collada. Uh, <laughs> uh, so there were some compiler errors as well. Um, I reported a few. 17.7 .7 was a particularly problematic version of MSVC, but it all works now, so that's all good. Uh, and there were a few warnings too, but you know we don't <laughs> we don't talk about those. And that's just from the debug build, by the way, which I did last night. The debug and release is closer to a million warnings, um, but there's so many of them that you just can't fix them because FFmpeg on its own probably generates about half of them because it abuses C in ways I didn't know was possible. Um, but now we had all the dependencies working. So the dependencies were working, and, but we actually need blenders to display something. And for now, we use OpenGL to display things. For now, Vulkan is coming soon. Ask your own for more details. Um, so we'll move to OpenGL. Um, drones work is progressing on it, but for now, I'll talk about how OpenGL works on these devices, which is a little bit unusual. Um, because what actually happens is it gets translated to DirectX. There's no OpenGL driver for these devices at all. Everything gets converted to DirectX. Um, and yes, it's implemented via Mesa, the same Mesa that does Linux drivers for graphics. It all goes through Mesa. Um, so you have your OpenGL state and drawing commands. Uh, they go into something called uh, Gallium, which is an abstraction layer within Mesa that essentially goes, okay, I'll take anything and convert it to sort of this intermediate thing, which then gets con converted into Direct3D12, which then goes into your DirectX adapter. Your fixed functions, hopefully no one's using them anymore and they're using shaders, but your fixed functions, they go into something called NIR, which is NIR Intermediate Representation which is one of those self-referencing acronyms that open source developers really seem to love. Um, and that sits between the, sort of the GLSL front end and uh, the driver IL, so DirectX Intermediate Language. And then that goes to your DirectX adapter. And then your WGL, so your windowing calls for all that sort of thing, well, that goes into either uh, DXGI swap chains, if you have a double buffered pixel format, or as a fallback, if it's not double buffered, it goes into the graphics device interface, so a CPU renderer, basically. So everything just leaps over, kind of gets dumped into that. There's not much CPU rendering going on. It's mostly okay because everything is handled by most of the other stuff, but there still has to be some. But with any system with this many moving parts, with everything changing constantly and updating, there's things that don't always work. And sadly, one of the big things that really, really tripped me up during the development was OpenGL 4.3. Um, Blender <laughs> changed OpenGL 3.3 to 4.3. Uh, and older GPUs, so this is an X Elite. The generation before this was called ACX Gen 3, and then older than that was Gen 2, Gen 1, and a bunch of others that were basically just mobile CPUs. We had to turn those the old ones off. Um, compute shaders are completely broken on those and because they're considered legacy devices now they won't get the driver update so we just had to turn off the older devices basically um, but because Mesa when you try and get the driver version to understand which device you have when you try and get that from Mesa well it just reports the Mesa version rather than the actual driver version so you have to I had to write a bunch of extra code to basically get the DirectX driver version and then work out what was working and didn't work on the DirectX version. Um, and that would basically let the incompatible devices be disabled. Um, but even with these devices, there was some trickery sort of still required because of the amount of layers of indirection. So we had to fake some features. So GLARB Texture View is an extension inside OpenGL. Basically, it does a bunch of stuff with textures. I won't cover it. Um, but it includes something called channel casting. And channel casting is essentially you have a texture with 32 red channels. Well, you can, in theory, according to this extension, just you know, go all the way down to r 8 g 8 b 8 So you can sort of do it through that, and this extension lets you do it. But Direct3D didn't let you do that until a very, very recent version, well, very recent in DirectX terms, version of the spec um, a couple of years ago. And the drivers of the development devices we had, which is the old ones, well, I didn't support that. But Blender doesn't use channel casting. 
Um, it uses views instead, which was a whole different approach of basically doing something similar, or it swizzles or it does that. So we can basically just tell the driver that we just fake it. We just said, yeah, it definitely works. We promise, don't check, pinky promise it works. Uh, and actually Blender runs just fine, as long as this bit is never used, but it's not um, as Clement has promised me. Um, so with all that, Blender could finally render something um, but there were a few changes that needed to be made to Blender itself. Um, first of all is MSVC's new preprocessor, which is required for SSC to Neon. It's mostly compliant to the C standards, but not quite. So as you can see, um, you just have to add another case for it. It should in theory work, but it doesn't. Um, it's, and it's opt-in only, so you have to switch on uh, you have to switch it on explicitly with a compiler flag and um, it causes problems. The Blender code base is now compliant. That was just one of the various changes, but it, it, it breaks macros all over the place when you switch it on. Um, and it is automatically switched on. So when Blender moves to a newer C++ standard, and if they're still using MSVC at that point, this should automatically kick in. So I've done some of your future proofing for you. Um, and then we had to uh, be able to get information about the CPU itself. So on Intel, this is easy, use the CPU ID instruction. Well, no, this is RISC. We don't do that in RISC. We don't have an instruction for any and every possible operation that you could possibly ever want and combine them into nothing else. It's RISC. So on ARM64, there is a register you could read, but it doesn't work here. It's complicated why it doesn't work here, but it only works from EL0. So if everyone goes back to their operating systems 101, if you ever covered that, there's a different privilege levels and things like that. Well, it only works from the top one, um, but due to a quirk of how uh, the operating system boots on these, it actually boots in EL1, so you lose any access to that register. There's a whole talk about it, about how they really struggle getting Linux working on these devices because of how the bootloader works, but that was from the Lenaro conference last year, if you want to go and look that up. Um, so we just let the operating system tell us. Well, we already do that on Linux and Mac. On Linux, we just do proc CPU info, Mac, you just re read Mac dep CPU brand string from sysctl. More well, Windows, well, you just read it from the registry. There's a registry thing right here. I didn't do it for x64 because I didn't want to break all the code that was already doing things and change things, but you can just read it from the registry, which uh, luckily Blender did a, a little bit of, so it was possible to do. And it reads out and it gives you basically the same output that CPU ID would give you um, on an x64 machine. Um, so with all that working, the code could be upstreamed. Um, so I did some upstreaming. There was a big pull request. I opened it in January 2024. There were 73 files and there were 10 rounds of review, not including all the stuff that was happening on all of the Blender chat channels where people were telling me things in private and so on and so forth. And it changed a, an amount of code. That's not including some of the dependency stuff as well because the GCC patch changed another 2,000 lines. Um, after 10 rounds of review, we finally went in in March 2024. Um, I did accidentally break a few platforms along the other way. Sorry, guys. Sorry, Aras. <laughs> I broke FFmpeg on x64 completely. Um, well, not completely. It just it had no optimizations at all. <clears throat> not intentional. Um, but there was a final win that we could have because this worked, but it worked okay. It wasn't particularly performant. It made these devices, and it made a lot of people that tried it go. Nah, it's all right, but you know, it's not the best. Well, we can use LLVM's Clang CL instead. We can switch the whole of MSVC out. So all that work that I covered, basically I dumped half of it off and we switched to Clang CL instead. Um, so these are the performance numbers. Um, so these scores, which for a lot of people, they might not be very impressive, but the TDP, so the power consumption of this chip is 30 watts. So for reference, that's 15 times less power consumption than a single 4090. Uh, so it's, it's a different class, but it's still quite reasonable performance. Um, this score is actually just about on level with the GPU of the M1 Max. So for just pure CPU rendering, it's, it's not bad. <laughs> um, there are a few changes, um, but 
it was less painful, uh, and, and I believe X64 is now also looking at it. You said 11% you got, have you? Yeah, 11%. So 11%. So there's some there's a win to be had on X64 as well with it. It's just a case of when does the work get done. Um, and now you've all heard about all of this. Uh, I'm sure you're all raring to go and get a build, and you're all going to run to MediaMark down the road and buy one now, I'm sure. Um, so you can go and download them now. Um, the alpha and beta downloaded. The full formal release should come with 4.3. Uh, Sergey said it yesterday, so I'm not announcing this by accident, I hope. Um, or you can go and build it yourself. The instructions just work if you want to build with MSVC. Clang is different, but ask me if you need to. Um, and with that, that's the end of my presentation. Has anyone got any questions? Okay, uh, so the question was about the fake OpenGL extensions where I fake enable it. Um, that's inside Mesa. So Mesa um, basically is the OpenGL driver and it fakes everything that's, it basically it reports its capabilities. So you just tell it to fake reporting that it has this capability, even when it doesn't and it just tries to execute it, which given we don't use the bits that are broken, it's fine. So it's when you build Mesa. When you build Mesa, it's one of the XML configuration files in the Mesa build system. So it's actually inside the OpenGL driver from Mesa. Okay, so it's done on the driver side. Yeah, it's done on the driver side. You, you can't just fake enabling everything. You have to go and build your own version of Mesa with it enabled, so basically. Yes. Cool. Um, I believe there are some render farms that do that. Uh, don't do that, please. There is, in fact, a few lines above that, a Baldur's Gate 3.exe that does exactly the same thing, yes. <laughs> but if you enable that fake uh, feature in Mesa, and uh, if the user doesn't have that specific driver, they probably won't be able to run Blender on it. So there's some other detection that's done before it even gets as far as that. Um, so I've disab I disabled the entire previous class of drivers that didn't have support for that. Um, and it only happens when you do it through the D3D12 sort of adapter inside Mesa. So the, D, so the D3D12 uh, adapter, no one except ARM really uses it. And if you're using Mesa on an X64 device, it's kind of assumed you know what you're doing because no one really does that. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, great. Well, uh, that's been a nice short presentation. Um, so one last thing, here's some links. I wrote a blog article on about this that is considerably more technical, technically dense than it was. Um, and then there's a bunch of stuff about Windows and ARM if you're interested about more, or just talk to me afterwards. I'm happy to talk about Windows and ARM, answer any questions that you might think may be better answered uh, off the record. Uh, so thank you. Um, so the question was about Vulkan. Uh, yes, I believe Jerrod is talking to Qualcomm actively and interacting with Qualcomm about this. Um, we're waiting for the next release of their Vulkan driver, which should be at some point soon. Um, <laughs> and when that comes out, it should have all the features required and you should just be able to switch the Vulkan backend on and we can bin off the whole OpenGL thing, which would be great really, because it's a lot easier. Anyone else? No? Okay. Right. Thank you. Here's some links if you're uh, interested.